as I was studying for this message today, last weekend we had a uh, prayer vigil here on Saturday evening, and then it went from 8 o'clock in the evening, One somebody was supposed to be here per hour for 12 hours straight until 8 in the morning, and then we had uh, communion service here on Sunday morning, and I, I went through this week, and it was kind of like, how many have ever had like a, a, a huge Christmas, and then about the day after you opened your gifts, you just felt kind of empty inside? How many have ever had that? Yeah? Two, three people. Okay, good. The rest of you celebrate Christmas? This week was sort of like that for me. I, I, I had just this turmoil inside of me, and I don't know why, and I kept asking God, what is it? What is it? What is it that you want me to share this Sunday? Because I thought last Sunday was, was a great day of communion, and I thought we had a wonderful time. And so I, uh, God kept asking me a question all week. And so I'm going to ask you the question he was asking me. Is that all right? Y'all good with that? Are you sure? So I have, a, I have this question. It's the same one that has been on me all week. As followers of Christ, if, if you've not made a commitment to Christ, I'm not talking to you right now, but as a follower of Christ, how many of you would say that there was a point and a time in your life that you were closer to God than you are right now? Don't, don't raise your hands. It's not an altar call. It's nothing. I might get to that later. Think about it. Take inventory in your life. I know that's what was coming to me this past week. Was there a time in my life that I would have said that I was closer to God than I am right now? And I'm asking you that question. In your mind, you answer that. Will you do that for me? Y'all thinking about it? All right. Is there a time that God seemed much nearer to you all the time? And there's times maybe now that you live your life and you're not quite sure if he's around, right? Do you remember a time, and these are the questions that were coming to me, because I remember a time when I would read the scripture and I could literally take my Bible, open it, and it was like, boom, that's just what I needed. You ever have that? And, and, and what was so cool about it, I'll never forget, I went out to California to the School of Worship out there at Reading. And uh, I remember on a Sunday morning, it was so full that they asked us as students to not attend the church service. And so we were asked to go do, to kind of do our own thing. It was that full, that Sunday service. And so I drove all the way up to Mount Shasta, which was about an hour and a half drive from where I was. I went up to Mount Shasta all by myself, and I remember so well. I was up there having my devotions on top of this mountain. I think I was like at 9,000 feet, something like that. And my, my scripture that I opened that morning and that God was speaking to me through was Psalm 98. I'll never forget it. And I come back that night. Uh, Ray Hughes is a famous uh, author, songwriter uh, from Nashville, and he writes a lot of, he has, has had a lot of uh, songs that he's written, number ones actually. He was speaking that night at the church, and, and I was asked to be there as security. I know. I'm intimidating. And I was there, and he got up, and he opened his Bible, and he said, if you have your scripture, your Bible, whatever you're reading with, I want you to turn to Psalm 98. And I'm like, whoa, you ever have that? And then the worship team will lead a song this morning that really ministers to your heart. And then there was a time when you would leave from here and on Monday morning you're facing one of the biggest weeks of your life and the first thing in the morning on XM radio on the message, there's that song. Then you would pray. There was a time when you would pray and you literally could visually see God answer simple prayers like driving to Walmart and say, Lord, I need a spot. I'm in a hurry. And the front row spot was open and you knew that God answered that prayer, right? You ever been there? There 
was a time that you couldn't wait for the weekend because it was going to be church and that the doors would open and you'd be the first one there and you would make your way and try to get on the front as far up front as you could. Then as time went by, you still believe in God, but that passion, the realization of what God has done for you has kind of gone away. Ever been there? Where'd it go? Things just aren't the same. Still show up at church, but the passion for it is kind of gone. In our congregation, you still have the light, but the light is just a little dimmer, right? Light in the valley, get it? So I'm, I wonder, and this is the question that God was asking me. I wonder how many of you were closer to God at another part of your life than what you feel you are right now. You had it. You had that passion. You had that sense that God was with you. You had the knowledge and you knew for certain that he was directing you in every way that you were walking. You knew also that he was answering your prayers. You had that feeling and that confidence that he's answering your prayers, but now it feels like you lost it. So I found a verse that the psalmist wrote in Psalm chapter 42, verse 4 through 5. This is an emotional verse. It's an emotional passage of scripture for me. And maybe, maybe, just maybe, you can relate the same way I did. It says, my heart is breaking. David's writing this. As I remember how it used to be. I walked among the crowds of worshipers, leading a great procession to the house of God, singing for joy and giving thanks amid the sound of a great celebration. And then he goes on to say in verse 5, he says, Why am I so discouraged? And why is my heart so sad? That's King David writing that. The psalmist. Can you relate to that? Why? I can, because why was I so close to him at some point, and I'm not so close to him now? What is, what is that? I've been there. The reason I get passionate about it is because I've lived it out. I know what it looks like, and I know what it feels like. And sometimes you get to a point where you say, well, I don't know if I can ever get back and Scripture will tell us, the, the text that we're going to today, if you want to turn to it, you can. It's Revelation chapter 3. The text that we're going to today, Jesus makes it very, very simple. He gives us three instructions that if you want that passion back, it's as simple as three things that you can do in your seat this morning. It's not a complicated formula. He gives us the answer. Because sometimes we feel like we had it. But we lost it. This morning, I want to help all of us get it back. IT. What is IT? It will change your life. That's what it is. It's something that will change your life. You know what? Just for an exercise, I want you to look to the person beside you, and I want you to tell them, if you don't have it, say it. Look to the person beside you. If you don't have it, it's time to get it. Now look at your second choice, the one that you didn't choose first. Turn to them, say, it's time you get it too. Yeah, yeah, very nice. You got to get it. Now I want everybody to say, I want it. So what is it? When I truly became born again, I, me and Becky went over this, and I, I, I said, you know, there was a time in my life, I mean, I accepted Christ when I was 18 years old. I got baptized when I was 18 years old, and then I went through a season of life, and, and some of the things that I did even after I was baptized, uh, I used to make the statement that, I, that, that Satan had me doing things he himself wouldn't do. 
I kind of veered off and then I'll never forget that we were invited to go to a worship service in another town, in another church. It was one of those Pentecostal churches. Y'all know what I'm talking about? The Holy Rollers. They roll things out of the way that aren't holy. You get what I'm saying. And, and we were invited to go there and I'll never forget it was just like a light switch flipped in Becky and I's spiritual life. We went there one night. I actually led worship there. I felt very under-equipped because they're speaking in tongues and doing all this crazy stuff, and I'm just playing guitar and singing. Like, it's like, it, be like John Schmidt opening up for the Beatles. It, it, it just wouldn't work. Sorry, John. Something happened that night, and when we got home, we made phone calls on the way home. Listen up. you got to come to this church service. We were introduced to something powerful that night that we, all our Christian lives, we had heard about it, but we had never experienced it. Now things are changing, and I remember the next night, there were other people there that we had called and we were like, you got to come check this out. And after the service, we went home and we opened our Bibles and we sat around our table and we started studying scripture. You talk about being on fire. We studied scripture till 3 a.m. And I could go on and on to tell you that the one night that we were doing that, actual angels came and sang at our house. Y'all want to escort me out? I'll go right now. Stay right there. All right, cool. Phil said I could stay. Like we experienced things that we had never experienced before. And, and wherever I went, it got on you because it was rolling off of me. I had people, I wasn't even, I wasn't even a, a, a preacher at the time. People would stop in at the store to go through scripture with me. We had Bible studies in, my, in the store. I was so passionate about the things that I had learned. It was like this extra layer of power and of spirituality. It came all over me. Do y'all know what I'm talking about? Has anybody ever experienced that? Now, I'm just going to be brutally honest. Have you felt that from me lately? Don't all answer at once. What happened? I had it. And then I lost it. And I want it back. Revelation chapter 3. Jesus is speaking to, through John's vision, he's speaking to the church at Sardis. And as I was going through this, this last couple weeks, I've, how many believe that what God's inspired word is meant, that was written for them, is meant for us as well. Can we establish that truth this morning? Y'all are not going to like me maybe when, you, when I'm done. And you know what? Next Sunday might be half of you here. I'm all right with that too. Kidding. But the church in Sardis was in the same boat. They thought they had it, but they didn't. And Jesus spoke it to them, and he revealed it to them of what it was that was missing. I'll give you a little bit of a background of Sardis itself. It was a capital city in a Lydian empire in the Asian minor. And you're going, Jimmy, now come on, man. We don't care about that. But I'm, I want to tell you where it was. It's, in, it's important. Because today, where that particular region is would be what we would consider West Turkey. Western Turkey. Their city back then was known for things. Things. They were known for all of their gold. They had a lot of wealth. They were known for their walls. The walls that they had built were huge. The one was 1,700 feet high. Just the wall. They were known for their protection, their security. They were also known for their fruit. If you wanted any type of fruit, Sardis was the connection to get it. Kind of like Hillcrest Orchard. That was bad, I'm sorry. But their city was known for their fruits. But the church wasn't. You say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, in Galatians chapter 5, Paul writes and he teaches the Galatian church what the spiritual fruits look like. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, those 
It's like if you live your life for Christ and if you have the Holy Spirit guiding your life, you'll have those types of fruits. They didn't have those fruits in the church of Sardis. Not much anyway. That was the church at Sardis. They had a lot of activity, but they didn't have much spiritual fruit. They thought they had it, but they didn't. They looked alive on the outside. And Jesus actually spoke very brutally to them and says, it looks like you're dead on the inside. Outside, it looked good. On the inside, it was dead. And I want to read to you what Jesus actually said to the church. This is written in red in Revelation chapter 3. Am I still all right? All right. Verses 1 through 2. Jesus said, I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Boy, that's brutal, ain't it? And then he says, wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Verse 3. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Verse 4 says, Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. In other words, Jesus is telling the church at Sardis, and I think we can take very detailed notes and apply it to us today. You have a reputation of being alive, but you're actually not. And that's where I see in our culture today, a lot of so-called churches and Christian churches and people that go there that are so-called Christians. Outwardly, there's a lot of spiritual busyness. There's Sunday school, small groups, uh, you name it. Uh, They listen to the message at work. I'm guilty of that. I do that. They serve somewhere. They go and help, and they're all about that. But deep down inside, there's something else. They call themselves Christians because what's the other option? What else would you want to be called? And what I've seen is people have enough Jesus in their life. They come to church. They can fake it. They have enough lingo in their heads. They can speak it. They know the words to the songs. They can help sing it. They can blend in, but it's not enough of Jesus to really change their life. I see it everywhere. They think they have it, but they don't. This is what the people in Sardis look like interesting story about Sardis. It was an ancient Greek city and many of those cities would have what they call an acropolis on top. So they would build their cities that would be fortified to the point that no one, none of the enemy could get in. And uh, Sardis was one of those cities. They had an acropolis up on top of a mountain. It's basically like a fort built on top of a mountain that uh, their army could be up there and they could see out and watch everything. And Sardis was one of those cities. It was actually had the uh, Acropolis up top. They had their soldiers up there. And there was actually a big river that ran around the bend. And and it enclosed it on two sides of the city of Sardis. And so they felt very, very, very comfortable and secure there, these people. And this is why Jesus used the analogy that he did about a thief coming in the night because this actually happened in 549 B.C. This was before Christ. One of the guards was standing up on that Acropolis and his helmet, his helmet fell off and fell all the way down, down to the bank of the river. And from a distance, the wall actually looked very straight that you couldn't climb it. But he decided he's going to go down and get it. He, wa- he, he scaled down that side of that wall, 1,700 feet, got his helmet and walked back, or not walked, but he climbed back up. Mission accomplished. But what he didn't know was that the Midianite army was watching from afar, and they saw for the first time, he just climbed that wall. We can too. So in the night, when everything was dark, the Midian army came across the river, scaled the wall, and they overtook the city of Sardis. That's why Jesus used the analogy that he did in Revelation chapter 3, because he knew they could relate. He knew his history. 
they had become complacent, comfortable. They let their guard down. They were asleep. They thought they had it, but they lost it. Revelation chapter 3, verse 2 is why Jesus said this. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. And that's my message this morning to me. And it's my message to anyone who's sitting here this morning. It's time we wake up. We got to wake up. Maybe there's a time when we had it and we were close to God, but we don't have it like we had it at one time. I know what it feels like. I've been there. I had it. I had it. I had it. I had it. Where's it at? It's a slow drift away. It's not like it happens overnight. It's slow. And one day we wake up. I'll tell you, I'm just going to be very, very transparent with you. And I know we have visitors here who may never speak to me again. But as a pastor, there have been times that I have caught myself and found myself praying more in public than I did privately. I also found myself reading scripture just to preach from. Not for my own benefit. And you're not going to have it if you're doing that. If that's you this morning, you're not going to have it. If the only time you open your Bible is when I ask you to open it and you come here, you're not going to have it. It's not going to be with you. I cared more about what people thought than I did about what God thought. I was distracted, complacent, sleeping. Here's the good news. There are things that we can do. I know that's heavy, right? Y'all still love me? Huh? One or two people? All right, cool. So what do you do when you realize that you're not as close to God as you once were? There's three things in Revelation 3. It's very, very simple. I'm going to go through them fairly quickly. There's just three things, and we can do them here this morning, and we can all walk out of here revolutionized and back in, on fire and passionate about the God we serve. Amen? I promise if you do these three, you will get it back. The first thing is that Jesus says, he just simply says, remember it. Verse 3, Revelation 3, 3. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. That Greek meaning of that word remember means to do it over and over and over and over again. I had the opportunity. It was an honor for me. There's a couple of our kids here at this, at this church that attend Legacy Christian over in Sugar Creek. And uh, they had a pastor appreciation breakfast this past Friday. And through that breakfast, they were telling us a little bit of how much scripture those kids memorize. And it's part of their credit system in their school. It is unbelievable. There are kids among us that could probably recite whole chapters. And I will tell you, that's part of remembering what God, what, he, what Jesus was talking about. It's not the only thing, though. We need to remember, bring it to mind over and over again. Psalmist King David wrote it like this in Psalm chapter 77, verses 11 through 12. He said this, but then I recall all you have done, O Lord, and I remember your wonderful deeds of long ago. See, I remember when I had that passion, and I remember when he visually answered prayers, and I remember when Becky's heart stopped, how God healed her, right? I can remember that. Those deeds of long ago, and those are the things that when I start remembering them and bringing them to my mind over and over again, you know what? The passion that I once had starts rekindling, it starts coming back to me. Amen? They are constantly in my thoughts. I cannot stop thinking about your mighty works. I remember. Some of you need to remember where you were before you met Christ. Remember where you came from. Maybe be, I'm not telling you to relive your past. That's not what I'm asking you to do. But remember how it was and remember how it is. There is a difference and you need to remember it. 
You need to remember how you were, how you felt when you were lost and how he came and found you. You need to remember how it felt to be hopeless and he comes and gives you hope. Or how about desperate? How about when you were depressed? How about when you couldn't tell the truth? You lived a lie to the point that you believed it. How about when you were addicted and you couldn't quit and he came in and made you whole? He healed your addiction. Do you remember that? I remember that. I remember when he answered my prayers. I remember when he provided for me. And I remember when he healed Becky's body. You remember things in your life that God has done for you. Think back. That's all Jesus is saying in that scripture. Think back. Remember. Remember what God did for you. Think about where you were and remember what he's done. Number two thing that he says, it's a very simple, is, is finish it. Revelation chapter three, verse two, it says, wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. What does the unfinished mean? If you had it, and you lost it, and you wonder where it went, maybe it's because you're not doing the things, the finished work of Christ. Maybe you're not finishing it out. He's asked you to pray for someone. You're not doing it. Maybe he asked you to give something to someone. You're not giving it. Maybe he asked you to share your faith, and you're not sharing it. It's unfinished. That's the unfinished work that he's talking about. Maybe he asked you to confess something, and you haven't had the nerve. Maybe he's telling you to trust it to him. I can relate to this, but I can keep on hanging on because I want to be in control. That's unfinished works. It's finished when we let it go. It's finished when we give it to him. Maybe he told you to ask for help and you just won't do it. Hey, I don't know. Maybe he told you to break up with that guy. Your mom don't like him. Your dad don't like him. Your brothers don't like him. Your sisters don't like him. And you keep pushing. I don't know. Becky did that. She ended up with me. You can say amen. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, I don't know what God's, I don't know. I'm not in your world enough to know what the unfinished work is for you. But there's unfinished work in all of our lives. Would you agree with that? There's things that come to your mind right now that you know that you could finish if you just step out and do it. That's what he's saying. The unfinished works. If you lost it, you remember it and you finish it. And lastly, you hold it. Hold it tight. Hold it close. Hold it dear to your heart. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard and hold it fast. And what? Never take him for granted. Never. Hold him close. You hold what's important to you. You'll hold it close. Our bank in Winesburg kind of sits where the, if there's any little wind, huh? it blows right through the drive through And I've had papers blow out of my hands, and I've, I've had cash blow out of my hands. So I've learned my lesson. When I get cash, I hold it. It's a dear to me, right? You hold what's dear to you. And you hold it tight. And, and, and he's saying, hold it fast. Hold Jesus fast. My mind went back February 26th of this year. I was working. And all of a sudden, my phone went. And I think I've showed these pictures before. I'm just going to show them again. All of a sudden, these, this, my phone went. And it was my daughter. Now, I have three kids. And I don't love one of them more than the other. But this particular morning, it was Chloe. Dad, I've had an accident. I said, honey, where are you? 
She said, I'm on 94 north of Mount Eaton. God did not design that hill right there on 94. I broke every rule of the road. Stop signs were a suggestion. The stoplight was a merely just a, it looked pink to me. And I was flying. And I'll never forget this. When I popped up over the hill, this is what I saw. You can put it up there. Is it up? All right. That's what I saw. And I put my, car, my truck in park. And this is what I remember so well. She came running to me, crying. And I held her, and I held her, and I held her. And I don't know, my time seemed to stand still. Didn't matter to me what trucks were coming. It didn't matter to me who saw it. It didn't matter to me what was going on around me, right? Because I hold fast and I hold close what is dear to me. That's all he's asking. That's all he's asking from us. Do you hold him that close? Like you would your child if they were in trouble. Brendan, you can bring your team up. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. We hold close what's important to us. Scripture says we run to him because when we draw near to him, he does what? He draws near to us. So we hold him close. That's our, that's our promise from Christ himself. And in Sardis, they looked like they had it. I'm just asking, are we the same? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. And maybe it's because of my leadership. I don't know. But last weekend, I will just tell you, I was so tempted, so tempted. Oh, hmm. we had a prayer vigil here. And I was so tempted to leave the chairs here of the people who came and the rest would have to stand. Do you know how many people would have had to stand last Sunday if we'd have done that? 345. I'm not coming down on you hard. I, I'm not. But we, we put a lot of effort in making that a special weekend. We're putting it all together. They, they worked hard to decorate, get the rooms right, and everything was perfect. And, and, and a few came. I'm just asking, does it really matter where God's leading us as a church to you? I'm not coming down on your heart. I, believe me. I'd have rather been deer hunting too, huh? No. What's dear to you is what you'll hold close to you. How you feel about God is exactly how you'll treat him. How you feel about your wife is exactly how you'll treat her. It's no better, no worse. It's just how it is. So this week I was struggling. What we do here, does it matter? Revelation chapter 3 verse 4 says, Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. In other words, they've not crapped their pants. I don't know, however you want to take that. They will walk with me dressed in white for they are worthy. Church, listen, it only takes a few. It only takes a few. I get that. But what if, what if, can you imagine if we were all so dedicated to the cause of Christ and what he's doing in our community and what he's doing for our church? What if we would all be that way? Sometimes it boils down to one. There was a young shepherd boy in scripture, David, he was by himself, young shepherd boy, brave enough to stand up against a giant, it just took one. How about the brave little girl, Esther, she stood up in a whole city that was against her, and it was because of her that things, the, the generation changed, that the genealogy of that changed because of Esther, it just took one. Maybe you're that one, would you stand?
God's asking you to be that one. One at work. They might laugh at you for your belief, but you continue to love him and you continue to serve him. Maybe it's you're the one in the class. You get it, you get it, and you bring it and you share it. You share the love of Jesus in your school. Maybe you're the one in your family, the only one in your family that can make a difference. And you know what? So thankful for the the people here, for our congregation. And you got to know I love you guys. But I was disappointed. I'm not going to lie to you. And then I think of this. And I I tell my staff, we were all a little bit distraught about the whole thing. And it was like this. Here's the deal, though. This is what I know God was showing me because if I or Brennan or, or uh, any of the people in our staff, if we start taking the blame for not, people not showing up, then we're going to start taking the credit when they do. And none of it's a good heart, right? Come on. So I remember, remember David at the beginning when I shared that his heart was broke. Here's how that verse finishes out. Psalm chapter 42, verses 4 through 5 says, My heart is breaking as I remember how it used to be. Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? Here's what David did, and here's what we can do. He says, I will put my hope in God, and I will what? A when? Again, he had the same, he dealt with the same thing, guys. He dealt with the same thing that the church at Sardis dealt with. He dealt with the same thing that you and I deal with. In other words, David said, you know what? Yeah, I veered off from where I was. I'm not as good as I used to be, right? I mean, he had an affair. He had a man murdered. I mean, the list goes on and on of the things that we could say that David did. But now he wants to come back again. And he says, I, with everything in me, I will trust him. And I will worship him. And I will choose to praise him again. How many would do that for God this morning? Revelation chapter 3, verse 2. This is my word to you this morning, all of you. It's the word to me because I'm not a perfect person. Y'all got to know that. You, do y'all know that? <laughs> I love you too, babe. Revelation 3, 2 says, Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die. So my words this morning, they're, they're simple. Wake up, guys. We all got to wake up. Let's quit acting like we're having church and let's do it. These are the three things. You remember what he did for you. You want to wake it back up? You remember what he did. You remember where you came from and how it is now. That'll put a spark in your step. You finish it. The things that he's asking you to do that you haven't done. Maybe it's make that phone call. Make things right. Restore a relationship. Do what he asks you to do and then you hold Jesus close. Come on, guys, let's, let's do church. Let's get back. I don't want to feel like when I read the church, to, the letter to Sardis that he's writing it to me. Let's bow our heads.